It's the last presentation, and I invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 1 is our opening text. How many of you had a good day today? Let me see your hands. <laughs> oh, amen. Praise the Lord. Good. I enjoyed that. We enjoyed our time with you. So we just got, I just got done with the Boys Academy, and my wife was at the Women's Academy, Women's Academy and we really uh, enjoyed our time with you and getting to know you. To us, it's all about relationships, so we really, like to, we really love spending time with you individually. That's more important than preaching, actually, so I really uh, enjoy being with you and getting to know you. So thank you for having us. It's a privilege to be here and an honor, so thank you. And we really enjoyed seeing you and just how you interact and your cheerfulness. That's a good sign because those who are put God first, last, and best are the happiest people in the world. And sometimes at the cafeteria in the morning, you see some really happy people, right? <laughs> so just having a really good time. Thank you. So Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to look at something called looking to the source. So in Hawaii, there's... Um, a, play, a place called, on my island, there's a place called Boiling Pots. And it's Boiling Pots because it has little pots, and the water flows over into the next pot like this, and it looks like it's boiling when it's, it rains really hard, and it goes to the next pot. So it's pots, and it's a tourist attraction. But do you know that I grew up next to this pot, and I grew up swimming in this area, but a lot of people have died in this Boiling Pots. So at this Boiling Pots, um, recently, it was just last year, there were some people who were walking. They were actually a travel nurse and with her, her boyfriend. They were walking across the water, and then they saw that uh, the water was rising. And so they tried to go to the other side, but actually, they got swept over the falls and they died. Isn't it horrible? And in fact, the mother flew from the mainland, and she was lost for three weeks. They couldn't find her body because the water is so strong, there's underwater underwater caves and tunnels and they got stuck in there and by the time they found her they, the face was so smashed up there was no face left it was just a skull no hair and it's a horrible thing and she was waiting every day with the fire rescue to discover the scuba divers every morning to find the body horrible another couple um, were here for a wedding the children just got married the, the, the son and he's a strong swimmer he's over not at the falls and he got swept over with his wife they both had died as well 60 years old 60 some so a lot of people, are, you always see helicopters. It, this one river called the Wailuku River accounts for 25% of all river deaths in all of Hawaii. Isn't that horrible? So the, the sad thing is that people come from the outside, but they don't know the area. And, but we're locals, we know the area. I s grew up swimming in these pots. Um, it's still pretty dangerous because people don't understand that there is a root cause of why people are dying. I understand it, knowing that you can't jump into a one pot because if you dump to one pot, the water normally will flow, overflows into the next pot, right? But some pots, you see no water overflowing into the next pot. So what does that mean? What's happening? The water is going into the next pot by how? Underwater tunnel or actual cave. Does that make sense? So they get sucked in, they get like a funnel, and they get stuck there, and the school divers have to pull their body out of that suction, right? Or in the case of what happened with the water flowing down, uh, it looks like a perfect sunny day here, right? But what people fail to see, that's like almost like the symptom, right? And you, you actually uh, see a sign, so, oh, everything's good. But you don't realize that 20 miles up the mountain, it's raining very hard, and there's rain clouds. If you were to just look, you see there's rain clouds up in the mountain. So what we need to do to survive is that we must look at the root cause to really live. You can't just look around at the outward symptoms and, and, and what's happening all around you, the effects. You got to look to the root cause. And that's why Ellen White says in letter 50, verse 1908, which is in your handout, she says, we must reason from what? Cause to effect. Okay, so I want us to think about that. And let's pray. Father, as your word is open, help us to see clearly with your Holy Spirit Grant me freedom as I speak. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Genesis chapter 1. So, 
Let's see back the cause effect. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Could somebody read that, please? I'm allowed with the microphone, please, at this time. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Okay, right there in the corner. Thank you for reading. Yes. One more time. Test. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, one through three. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So in the beginning, what was there? There was what? There was light, but before light there was darkness. So darkness comes before the light, right? So before we can apply the truth, we have to go back into, before the light can have its effect upon darkness, right, you got to go back into the darkness first. And then the, when there's darkness, then the light has power. But when there's already light like that, the light really doesn't affect. So you have to go back to the darkness first, and you bring the light, and then that's where the miracle happened. And God can bring light out of darkness. What do you say, amen? And that's how he works. And that's reason from cause and effect. You got to go back to the source, the source of darkness, and in the same way in a spiritual realm, you got to go back to the source of darkness, and then you can apply the light for that specific situation. I want us to look at, if we understand how the physical works, because our false education that we've been educated with has trained us to not think from cause to effect. I would say about 95% of the people out in the United States don't understand, and that's including Seventh-day Adventists, how to reason from cause to effect. We've been so brainwashed by a false educational system and a false cultural system to think a certain way, we think everything works this way, even the spiritual realm. So to understand the spiritual realm, we must understand how we think in the physical realm. So let's go to the physical realm. When someone is sick, okay, modern medicine and curing. Now, I'm, a, I'm totally for acute care. You're in a car accident, you're going to need surgery. I'm totally for that, right? I'm um, totally for antibiologic agents that says antibiotics and you need. But even then, that you can't use too much of it now with MRSA and everything else, right? Now, but in regards to chronic diseases, right, which is coronary heart disease, right, and cancer, and all these different diseases, God has given us some health messes that he can, we can actually heal from these diseases. What do you say, huh? Amen? Now, we often choose modern medicine to cure, to cut up the, di the diseased body parts. But think about it. Does that really cure the disease? Because what happens is if someone has high blood pressure, kind of mentioned a little bit, I think, Friday night. If someone has high blood pressure, what they're going to do is they want to take a little pill, right? And with that little pill that they take, it's going to... Uh, thin out the blood, and it's going to lower the blood pressure. So the symptom is showing that you have high blood pressure, right? You take a pill, it lowers it. Now, does that solve the root cause of the problem? Isn't that the easy way out? Because if you have the root cause, it's actually your lifestyle, right? Your diet, your exercise. But it's too hard to do this, so why don't we just take one tiny pill, and I'm good, and I continue to eat what I want to eat. I continue, I don't have to exercise. Does that make sense? So it's the easy way out to take the pill. But that's dealing with the symptoms, so here's the cause. But you have to go back to the root cause and discover what really is it here. Now, there's a quotation from Ellen White. And after this quotation, like, I don't even want to put on cream to take down my rash that I have on. That's medication, okay? Because I want to do it naturally. It says, when drugs are introduced into the system, for a time they may seem to have a beneficial effect. A change may take place, but the disease is not cured. See, the root cause. It will manifest itself in some other form. That's what we're talking about. In nature's effect to expel the drug from the system, intense suffering is sometimes caused the patient. And the disease which a drug was given to cure may disappear, but only to reappear in a new form, such as skin diseases, ulcers, painful disease joints, and sometimes in a more dangerous and deadly form. The liver, right here, the heart, and the brain are frequently affected by drugs, and often all these organs are burdened 
with disease and the unfortunate subjects if they live are invalids for life. There are those who die from the use of drugs, then all who would have died of disease had nature been left to do her own work. So it's talking about the use of drugs where now, you know, I think we come to the point where almost like we lost our health message where we can't deal with the harder diseases like cancer, autoimmune, that, you know, you have to be careful about saying no to everything, right, at that extreme situations. But I believe we need to get back, and the world is going into the health message direction. You guys notice that? It's so unfortunate that we've had the health message since 1863. That's 160 years ago, 157 years ago. And yet we should be the head, and yet even in our health message of our diet, Hollywood is all for it. That's a, you know that's a trend, right, right now in Hollywood, is, is the health message. And now we're all of a sudden we're like, oh, let's play catch up. Whatever happened to us mastering the health message, 160 years, shouldn't we have mastered it where our foods are better? But actually some of the restaurants out there is spectacular in the vegan. I mean, that's the restaurants I go to. And like, almost like we've lost the health message in that sense, right? And only if we have been faithful, and it's interesting that those of us who were faithful even when it wasn't popular, you know, we were able to practice and cook, we've been vegan for 25 years, and now that word is becoming popular in Hollywood, the world is now coming to us, right? And that's what we should be in everything. And so I feel like because of this, we've followed the, and we're thinking that symptoms and everything, oh, rash, let's put on medication, right? But it affects the, the chemicals stay in your liver and your heart and your brain, and it stays and it affects you. It diseases you. And so, like, in everything we do, you take, you take one pill, you think, oh, yeah, but it's going to disappear for a while. It's going to come back through another disease, I don't know what it says, right? So if you look at reasoning from cause to effect, if you just deal with the effects, yes, you're going to hide the symptoms, but it doesn't work. How many remember Fukushima in Japan? <laughs> remember the, the nuclear reactor and uh, all the radiation kind of like leaked, right? So what if you're a manager of Fukushima and you're just sitting there and all of a sudden... The alarm went off, and it was like beep, beep, and the lights are flashing, red flashing, alarm going off, and you're like, man, that's so irritating. And you're like, oh, where's that? And you grab the big sledgehammer, and you come and see the light, and you smash it, bang, and you smash the alarm, and you smash it up, and it stops beeping, and it stops going off the alarm, and the lights stop blinking, and you're like, ah, oh, there, better, I feel much better. I can now be at peace. <laughs> and you sit down and you go back to work. How many of you think that's crazy? God has put an alarm system in our body, right? When you get a headache, that's God's alarm system. That something's wrong. You didn't drink enough water. You're doing something, a lifestyle like drinking coffee, caffeine that's giving you headaches or soda, right? Like there's some kind of root cause. The symptom is only, effects is only telling you that back here somewhere, you got to discover what is that root cause. Does that make sense? And we discover what the root cause is, you make the changes, and then you come back, and then you're healed. Does that make sense? You go back to the darkness, and when you find out what the root cause in the darkness, search the darkness, bless you, <laughs> you search the darkness, and when you, you bring, then you apply the specific light, right? If you have a headache, specific light of drinking water, right? If you have um, a headache from caffeine, the specific light of giving up caffeine. Does that make sense, right? So that's the root cause. So many people in this world are conditioned just to take the pill and not reason. Does that make sense? We apply it to the spiritual realm. Now, this is real, where a lot of people have a problem. When we see a symptom like alcohol abuse, someone who's smoking cigarettes, our first thing is to be, is to be uh, behavior police. <laughs> I think it's so good at being, being behavior police, right? They like to be the food police, and they like to be the behavior police. And so what we do is we want to do the same thing. We want to take away the, the alarm. We want to take the, oh, you're smoking, huh? Okay, wait a second here. You take the big sledgehammer and slam them, right? And they're like, whoa, and you kind of break, you kind of make them stop. You need to stop smoking, otherwise you're not going to be baptized. But not realizing that alarm system that God gave them, like, almost like it's a negative emotion, is, a, is actually an alarm system that God's warning and say, hey, wait a minute, there's something down here that we got to go back. You got to go back to the, look to the source. That's the name of my presentation. Like the mountain. Look if there's any rain clouds up there. And that's how you determine whether you're going to be safe or not. And you go back to the source and discover, why is that person smoking? You know, give me my cigarette. I'm, I'm, my nerves is irritating. I'm, something's stressing me out, right? 
and so the smoke, I calmed down. The anxiety went away, right? What is the alcohol you're drowning out your sorrows with? What is it that's hurting you that you don't want to feel it, right? You got to go back to the root cause. Any questions? I want to throw it out there. Any questions anyone has right now at this point? Kind of raise your hand. Any thoughts or questions on root causes? I kind of want to hear where you guys are at because many times when I'm teaching, I realize that people don't follow me. <laughs> and they think they get it, but when they start talking, you realize that they're not with me. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay, how do you find a root cause? Okay, good, good. W were you talking physically or spiritually? Which one are you talking about? Okay, both. Okay, so, okay, like, um, like I think before, we kind of lost it. Like, you got to get correctly diagnosed, in a sense, and physically. But you notice that we come to the point that even physicians today, they're no longer looking at symptoms to discover. They're looking at what? To find out what's wrong with you. What are they looking for? How did they find out where you got something that's wrong? They're looking at, they do blood tests, right? It's almost like they're looking at symptoms to discover what was wrong. They kind of do a little bit for simple things, but for the majority of times where they don't understand what you got, they do blood tests, and they do blood tests, and they do blood tests. And many times you can go months of blood tests and not find out what's wrong with you. There's kind of a trend that's happening that they kind of find out what's wrong with someone for months sometimes. And sometimes they're misdiagnosed, or even for years, because they no longer can read symptoms anymore. And if you can't read symptoms, you cannot go back to the correct diagnosis of what is the, the root cause. Does that make sense? So in the physical realm, you can't give a correct um, solution if you're not giving a correct diagnosis, right? So in the spiritual realm, in the same way, you got to have a correct diagnosis of what they're going through before you can actually give a correct solution. And everyone is different. Every situation is different. You can't blanket something and say, oh, new, what, all you got to do is change your diet and new start it, right? Just kind of follow new start. But that's, I tell people like, did I mention that here? Well, with the, with the guys, it's kind of like, when, I tell, when people say, hey, you, you need to read your Bible and pray more, what they're really saying is that, I don't know how to help you, but I want to sound spiritual, so I'm going to tell you that you need, need to read your Bible and pray more. <laughs> Does that make sense, right? It's like the generic answer of uh, Christianese or Adventist, uh, the language of Christians, Christianese. Yeah? So <laughs> and I think in the same way, when people are sick, we're like, when you're sick, how many have people like, plenty of people come and say, hey, you need to try this, you need to try that. Like, all of a sudden, everyone's like a doctor, right? They, hey, try this. And like, oh, I'm tired of it. I tried this and this and this, and nothing works already. I want to go and try modern medicine, right? And I think... Um, People don't even know what you have. And say, so, oh, this is a miracle thing. And say, so they helped my brother for uh, cancer. And like, well, I don't even have cancer. I just have a cold, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but they're trying to apply a solution. Or like, oh, you need to go to New Start and this exercise and, um, you know, have fresh air and have sunshine. And that's all good. But you got to treat everything specifically. Like even at, say, say at Weimar, uh, the diabetes is treated totally different from coronary heart disease. And that's why, like, diabetes, they believe in, that's why we my hose, zero oil when I was there, okay? I lost, like, I was 50 pounds lighter than I am right now at Weimar. I was, like, a skinny because there's no oil and there's no salt in those days. And they felt that we were all New Start patients, but we were really students. <laughs> so they gave the therapeutic diet to us, right? But they use no oil because they feel that actually um, heals way faster for people with type 2 diabetes. So... But again, that's not for everybody. It's not for healthy students, I think. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, but it does work for them. So there are specific ways to treat, but you have to know what is the correct diagnosis, then you can get the correct treatment. Does that make sense? Like, you got to have the correct diagnosis. You can't just shoot in the dark, oh, this new start, eight laws of health, just do it because it is the right thing to do, and you're going to be healed automatically. That's not true. Jethro Kloss, you read all our pioneers, like, they didn't believe that. Julius White... Kellogg, none of them believe that. They believe that everyone has a specific root cause of a diagnosis and everyone has a specific um, treatment for a specific root cause. Okay, good. Okay, go ahead. Question. Yes, question. And by the way, just to parallel it, the same thing goes in the spiritual realm. Okay, kind of think about that. Good, good question. Thanks, Chris. Right here, in the front row. On the end. Okay, so this is sort of like um, a comment over 
what you were talking about, the root cause, because this is something that I also learned um, when I was working in a sanitarium. They had many patients with cancer, mm. but um, my mom, she made me watch a video <laughs> about cancer and what happens. And she told us, and the video said about, um, it was a Jewish doctor, and he said that the cause of cancer is not just because of like the way you eat or you know just physical activity, but it's also it also has to do with how you feel. Like for example, people that have colon cancer, mm. he referred to that as specifically it's people that um, feel a lot of anger and pride, so mm. it affects that certain organ. Mm. Or if you have um, breast cancer, he said that that tends to be with people who think they're superior to their parents in the family or have a lot of, like, re have a lot of rebellion towards their mom. I don't know, and it was very interesting how he said that. And I actually got to see that with my own eyes. I met this girl who, um, I talked with her and she said that her, the way her family was set up, you know, was a very broken family. And she had a lot of anger. She was also very prideful. And she was actually a nurse, she studied to be a nurse. And she said that, um, I mean, what happened to her was she got like um, a lot of pain here in her colon area, and she ended up having, you know, like a little small rock coming out from there. So, wow. Yeah, it's very interesting how that can affect you. You're right on, actually. Do you hear what she said? That's powerful. That's actually part of my presentation. Like, she's really ahead. So, only think about that. So, well, you want to come up here and give the presentation? Is that right? <laughs> so, just this thought, I want you to think about it. Here's this quotation. I'm going to read this quotation because we're going to lead, let the Holy Spirit lead on this. But notice what it says. We're going to jump to the spiritual realm. Now, notice there's a root causes, okay? So let me read this quotation. It says here, Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. What is nine tenths? What's the percentage? Ninety percent. Ellen White says, ninety percent of physical illness comes from negative emotions. That's the true health message. I have people who are medical missionaries on the deathbed say that this is one area that they wish they died of cancer themselves, wish that they had studied more negative emotions, nine-tenths, and yet we treat, I'm guilty in the past, we treat the health message as if it's 99% what you eat and what you do. Are you following me? When other one says the true health message of a medical missionary is treating the negative emotions of the mind. Okay, now I want you to think about this. Now we're dealing with cause and effect, okay? Now notice what the word says, she says foundation. So, all of a sudden, you're eating junk food. You've seen people that are eating junk food and they have no diseases in their body. Do you guys notice that, right? And they're doing well. Then all of a sudden, boom, they plummet one time. You know why? Because somehow, they have the symptoms of the disease. Somehow, they had a negative emotion such as a loss of a child. The child died in a drowning accident. That triggered, the negative emotion triggered the, the disease and they went plummet down into cancer. Does that make sense? Type 1 diabetes, right? You guys heard of that, white type 1 diabetes, which actually they say is incurable. If you do, there's actually um, research that come out there, I think it's a journal of New England, um, on diabetes journal. It says that children of traumatic childhood experiences are three times more likely to have type 1 diabetes. Negative emotions, traumatic childhood experience, triggers, are you following me? So with these negative emotions, right, that's triggering it, now, when you're going to cure it, what you got to do is this. You have to follow the, the health message. You have to use the eight laws of health, hydrotherapy, herbal medicine, right? You have to use that to heal somebody. That's the symptom because, example, if somebody has a headache, right, and they have a migraine. We actually, in our school, we have a migraine tea, okay? That's from, that's from Jetto Claus. I have never met someone who had a migraine and it didn't work on yet, okay? So, say if somebody has a migraine, and then you know they need to change the diet. And you say, well, you just need to change your diet and not drink any more coffee. And you see you later. But they have a painful migraine for three days until it finally goes away, right? The loving thing to do is not only deal with the root cause so it won't happen again in the future, but you got to deal with the present symptoms that they're currently going on through now so they are, they're not thinking of anything else, but I don't care about three days from now. I want, I'm suffering now. I need help now. Does that make sense? So you give them the tea to relieve the, 
the migraine now, and then you help them off the caffeine so it won't come back and be re-triggered to come back. Does that make sense? So in the same thing, in the, in, if you help someone to overcome that, like say coronary heart disease or say, um, let's say diabetes, right? Yes, you are changing, you're actually healing the symptoms of the physical side of the symptoms they're having, right? But you got to go back to the root cause. Like what is the root cause that's causing that? Because if you don't deal with this root cause of the negative emotions and heal from the negative emotions, that negative emotion is going to re-trigger, I think when I say the disease will come back in another form. Does that make sense? I know it's difficult to grasp root causes, cause and effect, but as Christians, you need to understand. If you really want to heal people physically, emotionally, and spiritually, you have to rethink a different way than what the world has trained us to think. Yes, something. Go ahead. I was just Continue. thinking that, you know, we, we realize that, you know, that what you are sharing, and I think I can apply to my personal life, but if we see that somebody else is suffering or we are trying to help somebody else, um, what will be a good process, a good approach? Because they may not be aware, you know, how mm -hmm. can we deal or address with somebody? that we realize that probably the source of their problems are coming from their childhood or something like that. I just want to have some idea. I think people, a lot of people are kind of set in their thinking. Like they don't think of cause or effect. So no one's really thinking that maybe the type 1 diabetes was triggered from a traumatic experience. Even though, for example, I was talking to this one girl who has type 1 diabetes, her and her brother, which is very rare for siblings to have it. And I kind of mentioned it, and um, she didn't really want to go there. Like, you, they have to be open to reason to cause the effect. Uh, there was actually another conference I was speaking, and a speaker approached me, and another speaker, and he said, you know, I have type 1 diabetes, and I feel that you have the message that's going to help me to heal from it. Because I realized that when I was younger, um, right after my parents got divorced, that's exactly when I got type 1 diabetes. So they see it. I think we have to help people to reason from cause to effect, and once we help them reason from cause to effect, they're going to see that maybe I'm the one that there's something in my life in the past that has triggered something, and then they're going to want healing, because otherwise they're just going to take drug medication or surgery or something like that. Um, that helps. It's hard. It's hard to convince someone who doesn't see it that we can't. We can't lead a horse to water, but we can salt the hay. <laughs> you can make them want it. <laughs> question. Oh, okay. Question in the front. You had a question. Oh, okay. You had a question. Okay. <laughs> I had a quick comment. I find it very intriguing that what you mentioned with um, a lot of times with the medical that we think that instead of wanting to put in the hard work, that we just take the easy way out, mm. and that hurts us in the long run. And I find it very intriguing matching that with the spiritual, of that sometimes we're more prone to take the easy way out than we are to actually do it God's way. And that is a very interesting connection that definitely yeah. something to, to mull over. Amen. I think um, we had last weekend that somebody came, our uh, Adventist, and they feel that we got to cast out uh, the demon of impatience and the demon of you know, deliverance ministry by the Adventist. So... They want to cast out demons. And what it does is, if you're demon-possessed, then it's not my fault. If I'm demon-possessed, it's not my fault. Therefore, I have no choice and no action to take. Then it, all it is is just pray for me. Does that make sense? And we can do that too. Like, all we need to do is deliver this person. What we got to do is just pray for this person. You know, don't, don't we have to do anything but pray for him, and God's going to heal him. But God, otherwise, says God has given us the natural remedies to use to heal people, right? And so there's faith is going to work because we do love him, but there is God's way Look at Jesus, right? Didn't Jesus also use clay, right? And in natural clay, how many use natural clay to heal, right? And spit into it, right? Natural remedies, put it on his eyes, and what did he do next? Told him to what? Hydrotherapy, right? <laughs> Wash in the river, right? Even Naaman was told to do hydrotherapy seven times in the river, right? Hydrotherapy. Um, Hezekiah was going to die, right? He was given 15 extra years. What did he use? Poultice of figs, natural remedies. So there's natural remedies and everything that um, Jesus, notice that G Jesus, 90%, where did he get that? Ellen White get that from Jesus. Remember when people were paralyzed on the ground? He'd go up to them. What would Jesus say to them? 
He would say, he didn't just say at first many times, rise up and walk. He would first say to them, your sins be forgiven you. What sins? The sins of bitterness, the sins of unforgiveness, the sins of anger, the sins of you know, guilt, the sins of shame. These negative emotions Jesus felt was the root cause. And once they heal from these root causes, right? And then, okay, by the way, rise up and walk. Your physical symptoms will disappear. So Jesus understood this passage, what Ellen White was saying. 90% of illnesses has its foundation in the mind. The woman at the well, emotional healing, everything was, that's the true, whole, complete, physical, emotional, and spiritual health message that God has given our children. And by the way, let me tell you this, that the world today, the trend, let me tell you about trends. I like to follow worldly trends. Um, because sad to say, the church doesn't follow the spirit of prophecy in the Bible anymore. It follows worldly trends. Because the church is jumping on the bandwagon of the health message only because Hollywood is pushing for it. And all the movie stars are becoming vegan and everyone else and all the pop singers. And all of a sudden, we're interested in the health message all over again. We should have health message and they should have been following us. But that's how rebellious we are. And yet, right now, the trend right now is emotional healing. And yet we have the complete package right here in the spirit of prophecy. Ministry of healing, mind, character, and personality, volume one and volume two. The spirit of prophecy has so much on healing, and yet the world is moving in that trend. And right now, beloved, we have to have something to give to them. They're longing for more something than pop psychology. We have the message only God's love can truly heal physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And that message God has given to us as a people, his remnant people. So something to think about. Nine-tenths, 90 percent of all sickness comes from negative emotions. Go ahead. So you mentioned that like sometimes when someone's going through something, um, a common answer <clears throat> is just like, well, you need to read your Bible more and pray more because you don't know what else to say. And I feel like this weekend we've, we've really dug into what are the root issues of the things that we struggle with, you know, like what in our past, like what. So now we know the root thing, but now you're leaving. So what roots do we take to find this, like, so like the solution? Because now we have the root issue, but we, I'm, I don't know what to do for that, like those specific root issues to get to Kay. success. And that's why it takes time. But I think my point is, I th this presentation is, primary focus is to help you to reason from cause to effect that's thing i think once that's the first step like, like the stages like you can't learn everything in one day in a, like in everything even in the medical profession you can't just learn all the different diagnoses for every single physical sickness that is out there so in the spiritual realm you can't just um, learn all those different spiritual sicknesses root causes all in one presentation as well so it just takes time to learn these different things yeah so so what would you like recommend to us because now we've taken that first step we we know the things that really caused us pain in our lives and now what's the next thing we can do to like evaluate the next steps you know to find okay. healing from it okay um does everyone understand though does everyone understand root causes right now cause and effect effect maybe i don't maybe yeah pretty me. much oh okay i mean the, do you understand the whole concept of reasoning from cause to effect do you kind of understand that? Maybe not the specific things, but understand the big picture that there is a cause and there is an effect. Does that, does that make sense? Does everyone, are we all together? Yeah, you could come up here and actually give a little short talk and explain it. Is that good? Okay, good. Okay, cool. So any other questions? But I'm going to give a little bit more after this, okay, to help us get a little bit more into the mind and what Ellen White says, how our mind works to go back to the cause. How does that sound? And at the end, I'll give you something as well. Okay. Question. Somebody had a question here. No, I just wanted to say oh. I wanted to follow up on like the question. Now what? Yeah, well, now I don't know. <laughs> now what? I mean I'm leaving tomorrow morning, right? So Oh, what do you do? Um Okay, practical. Okay, so in our school, we try to follow the principles of Madison, and it works really well with emotional healing. So uh, the principle of, and you do it here, which is really good, and I think you're able to break the mode of not reasoning from cause to effect, which is actually life skills classes. Like, we call it life skills classes, which is actually trades. So, like, every Israelite was, was required to learn a trade. 
So, and when I say trade, like work education, I'm not talking about like I used to do it, do it way more, sit at a desk and answer phones and that's a trade. No, a trade is something like you productive, like a commodity, a productive, tangible product you're producing, such as um, auto mechanics, right? Um, like carpentry, agriculture. Does that make sense? And not just like work that you don't really need skill to do. Does that make sense? Like, because what you want to do is you want to learn how to problem solve. And the more problem solving you're learning through like these work study classes, with like especially those three and more so, um, that's going to help you to reason more from a practical sense, cause the effect. So the miracle in the school of the prophets in 2 Kings chapter 6, remember that they're chopping down the, uh, remember, they, remember uh, Elisha? They said, let's go build a new building, school building because the school is too small, right? So they went out and they were chopping down the trees, right? Remember he cut the tree and what happened to his axe head? It what? Flew into the water, right? So first of all, Elisha didn't want to work with the students, right? So, um, but the students begged the teacher to work with the students, right? <laughs> and that's why Ellen White says about teachers working with students in the productive trade. So they went out into the, um, into the water and then actually, what did he do? He said, throw the stick out there and what happened to the ax head? It floated, right? So my question is always to the students, like where did a miracle happen? Did a miracle happen in the classroom, in my class where I taught on emotional healing, or did a miracle happen in the life skills class of your agriculture class you're in? Where did it happen? In, in the trades class that you're in, your work study class, your, where you actually reason from cause to effect. That's where the miracles happen. So what happens is we notice that we, I give the classes in the morning, but I believe that my miracle, the po most powerful part of the school is not the intellectual classes. And anyway, it says, if you have to reason, if you have to give up whether the study of the books or the trades classes, he said, let it be the study of the books. You guys read those quotations. How many read those, that quotation before? Okay. So meaning that the trades are more important because the trades teach you how to reason from cause to effect. You problem solve. All the mechanics, you can't figure something out. You, what is the root cause? You try that? No, it's not that. You try this? No, that. After a while, you build up, otherwise says you build up something called common sense, he says. And then also that, you're working with a teacher. Uh, it builds hearts of bond with the teacher and the student and cords of love when you work together. And that opens the way for more successful teaching in the classroom. So if I connect with the students and I work with them like that, we're connected in heart. And then when I'm teaching in front of them, then they listen to me more. <laughs> and they take the messages and they actually grow exponentially. So I think work study is probably the best to re-educate our minds on how to think from cause to effect in a practical sense. And then we can figure it out with the help of the Holy Spirit how to figure out root causes on our own. That's the power of the spirit of prophecy in the school of the prophets. So that's a practical, one practical way that we do. Okay, many hands. Okay, Chris. Um. I, I guess what I'm getting here is like um, there's so many different root causes it's hard for you to just dig through and find a solution for every every single thing that could pop up um, but I, I feel like it would help if maybe you had a story like you said there was somebody that had gone through a divorce or their parents mm -hmm. went through a divorce um, earlier and they were suffering from something like how would you deal with maybe you could share us a story of how you've dealt with something like that okay so I give you a story that just happened at our school. So there was someone who struggled with deep anxiety for years. She was such a great depression about it. She felt she was never going to escape the dungeon of despair yeah, that she was in. And she didn't want to come to our school. She had given up hope. She finally was going to back out many times. She decided to come. She came to the school. And then, then she was going to leave. She said, I wasn't going to finish the program, I was going to just stay a couple of days and leave because I knew that your program was going to help, help me. But one class helped her, and that was actually a class called Twisted Guilt. And I found out that a lot of Adventists are struggling with guilt. And the root cause of her anxiety, you think, anxiety? I mean, what was the root cause? But it's all different. So, but her root cause of her anxiety was actually living in a guilt. And her, she was confusing, and a lot of people do is, the root cause of guilt, a false, you know, there's good guilt and there's a false guilt. The root cause of a false guilt is always legalism, which is a false righteousness by faith, is a false righteousness by, by, which is righteousness by works. And it's a subtle thing that's kind of implied throughout our churches and we won't even see it. And this was a person who was a program, you know, she was a leadership of 
um, GYC Southwest. So she's heard a lot of sermons and everything, but she was not able to overcome this. But it's actually understanding what is the voice of God in relation to guilt and what is the voices of Satan. And when you, that was what set her free. She was so excited. She said, I'm free. She couldn't believe it. She said, I had to wait. She said, I, I had to wait two days past her before I called my family to let them know that I'm healed because I didn't believe it was true. Because you've been in darkness so much, you don't think that you can escape it. And so when she, I just talked to her like a week ago, a few months later, she says she's totally, completely healed. There's nothing anymore. Years in depression and anxiety. So that's like a root cause. You have to find out specifically. And now all anxieties are the same. That's why you have to find out. And that's why you learning, it's almost like if I'm teaching you, I'm not teaching you. You become a reflector of my thoughts. Like there is principles that you do learn. It does take time. Um, but you have to learn how to reason the cause and effect. That's the first thing you have to re-educate yourself with and learn on that. And then after that, you can definitely grow. Mm. And it just takes time. And so once you did that, you just took her through a proper understanding of righteousness by faith, and that's what helped her. It was actually, there's a class in this defining what, in that class was intertwined righteousness by faith in relationship to guilt, and it just, it just totally helped her. It set her free, yeah. So righteousness by faith, God's love is the solution for a lot of mental illness. Question, go ahead. So let's say that I understand that there's a cause and effect that, like, let's say I have low self, con low confidence, mm -hmm. and I see that it is because of relationships earlier in my life, mm -hmm. and just like relationships with other people, how could I get to where I can see what I do for that to overcome that? Okay, so um, there's a, okay, let me go into uh, this little thought here. This is, in your handout, there's something called from In Heavenly Places 164, okay? So kind of follow this question. We have to get into the mind with the spirit of prophecy, okay, first, and then I, I'll go back to this, okay? Uh, so it says here, the, the thoughts and the feelings combined make up the what? Moral character. So what's the only thing we're going to take to heaven? Our character. And what's our character made out of? So what's the only thing we're going to take to heaven? Our thoughts and feelings. Not our external behavior or anything. Does that make sense? So our thoughts and feelings. When we, when we say the word character, we refer, we're referring to our thoughts and our feelings. How, so there's thoughts and our feelings. So this is how you think back and, and deal with the, the spiritual side of healing. So thoughts and feelings. But what follows with, right? Is that a good question, right? So you look at the Spirit of Prophecy, and she says in Heavenly Places 164, if the thoughts are wrong, the what? The what will be wrong? The feelings will be wrong. So what follows what? Does the thoughts follow the feelings? I mean, there is some to the stand, but especially in this, what or does the feelings follow the thoughts? Okay, so if you have negative thoughts, right, you're going to have what? Negative feelings. You know, I've always wanted to do this when I, when, I, um, when I teach this. Like, can I just put this here? Like, okay, yeah, this is good right here. And... Um, this is another chair I'm going to use right over here. And, um, okay, very good. This is thoughts. So this is thoughts, right? Negative thoughts lead to what? Ellen White says to what? Negative feelings. But the opposite is also true, right? So if you have good thoughts, what's going to have, how are you going to feel? Good feelings, right? Okay, so now the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth what? speaks the mouth is speaking on where on the inside or the outside outside right but the heart is on the inside or the outside the inside so out of the abundance of the heart what's on the inside your thoughts and feelings will be the outside which is your actions right does that make sense to you so what's on the inside is going to be revealed on the outside so i wasn't visiting um a seven, no, seven day Avenues, but the family was seven day Avenues. A, a person who was in prison, and uh, there was a double murder in our hometown in Hawaii. I know it was the first time ever, and this person had gotten two men and was in prison. And he told me the story where he was in. These two men were kneeled down executioner style, and he shot on the back of the head and killed both of them. 
Okay? So you tell me, based upon this model, what Ellen White says, what kind of music do you think he was listening to? Orchestral music? <laughs> you, what do you think they're listening to? Death metal. Death metal, yeah. Gangster rap. Are you following me? I'm going to shoot you, kill you, shoot it up, right? That's what he's thinking, right? He's listening to his, his thoughts, his negative thoughts, right? And what happens with these negative words coming in, right? What's going to produce? Negative what? Feeling. They're going to feel, oh, they're all amped up, ready to go, right? And then they're all amped up, ready to go. And what happens? When they go out there, they were never planning to kill anyone that night. But they went out, what happens to the negative feelings? They became what? Negative actions, behavior, right? So the mind affects your actions. So, so what I do is, so what is this right here? Your what? Thoughts affect your, feelings affect your actions, right? So that's the spirit of prophecy and how that works. So what you do is you can actually go, to answer your question, you go backwards. So in my experience, if you have a low self-worth, automatically I know everyone who has a low self-worth I automatically know that they were abused in some way. Some way where it was verbally abused or emotionally abused or sexually abused or physically abused because abuse always leads to a low self-worth. So anyone with low self-worth, that's why you almost like, that's why I tell my daughter I can read your mind because in a sense, like, I feel like because what we know and what I see, I can see how someone relates and behaves in a body behavior. I can almost like, you can figure out from their actions and even their negative feelings, you can actually figure out before they're even telling you what they're thinking. And I can even go into the mind and say, has this ever happened to you? He goes, wow, how did you know? Because you're going backwards. You're going back to reasoning from cause to effect. You're going back to the root cause over here. Does that make sense? Like, and you go back here and you discover what is the root cause. And you discover from there. So, So it depends on what is the root cause. Low self-worth? Is that what it is for you? Yeah, that's a whole different presentation. Okay, but um, for the sake of time, I can talk to you after. How's that? Does that sound good? Okay, great. So. Um, I was going to say quickly, uh, based on the knowing what the cause is, um, if you do not know the causes of diseases, like talking in general, yeah. it's going to be hard to reason from cause to effect. So yeah. your primary work in that sense, uh, being a church that is so immersed in this health message, is to learn the cause of diseases. Ellen White says, as we move towards the end and we're going to approach the, the, the uh, we're going to lose liberty of conscience, uh -huh. that the people of God should learn about diseases uh -huh. and its causes. Uh -huh. And once you familiar uh -huh. yourself with diseases and its causes, then this would be your next step. You have to really go back and really learn. It's kind of like, let's say we were having like a class on carpentry. Uh -huh. Like, if anybody wanted to take up the work, they're going to have to go back and learn the basics. Uh -huh. So if somebody haven't learned the basics here, then that would be definitely something to, to look into, whether through spirit prophecy, uh -huh. science. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there. That definitely would be a point. Uh -huh. And one quick thing here, in finding the cause for some people, uh, in John chapter 1, first words out of the mouth of Jesus is not, I have a solution for you, is what seek ye? I mean, that's a question that makes people talk. And when people talk, that's when people tell you who they hate. That's when people tell you who they love most. That's when people tell you their relationship with God and all of that. And I've seen this face-to-face -face with people. Uh, a, a lady had diabetes, and then we approach her, and, and the sugar is not going low for nothing. All types of herbs are used. All types of methods are used. And then a certain day, she was counseled spiritually. And we found that she had... Somebody that she really was holding grudges against. Mm -hmm. That very day, counseled, prayed with, she called the person and said, I forgive you. Amen. Take a deep breath. The next day, the sugar starts to go low. Amen. So okay. how in the world can we approach certain things yeah. with an herb or, 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 or a diet? That's kind of like going to Nebuchadnezzar. I know the Lord has given you a, 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 a nightmare here. I'm going to give you valerian tea for it's going to help you. Yeah. No way in the world. That is a <laughs> spiritual problem. Yeah, yeah. And no other way. Yeah. Daniel was a right medical missionary. He knew what yeah. to apply there. So I think we have to get ourselves familiar with those things. The other scene is very prideful. 
like, we have to have a message. Like, when I went out of Weimar, I was like, man, I'm going to go through the world. I'm going to teach this world. I'm going to teach the church something, you know? It's kind of like you have that institutional pride, too, yeah? Like, you just think that you're going to teach them something, but God's going to say, no, I'm going to teach you something and going to humble you as a minister. So you have to be humbled first. Even, like, Nebuchadnezzar needed to be humbled, too. So, but you're right there. Think about it. The Bible text says, the hearts are failing them for what? The physical heart is failing them for a negative emotion of fear. There's that mind-body connection again, right? You see that? So there's always that mind-body connection. You can't separate it too. And what modern medicine does is, modern, if you're physically sick, where do you go? To a what? Medical doctor. Separate. If you're mentally ill, who do you go to? Therapist, psychiatrist, psychologist, right? Counselor. If you're spiritually sick, who do you go to? Pastor. You see, they separate the mind, body, spirit. But the Bible always connects it together. Jesus always connects everything together. You can't separate them. And that's why they can't really solve things because they're trying to heal things separately. But that's why God gives a complete and whole health message that you combine the physical, you combine the emotional, you combine the spiritual. You can't just deal with the physical, like you said, right? You can't just deal with the emotional without dealing with the physical. You can't just deal with the spiritual, right? Uh, even what we eat affects us spiritually, right? So even Daniel, when he ate, Daniel, when he changed his lifestyle, right, he actually was, he looked healthier, right, and than all the other friends, right? And then he was wiser, right? His friends are wiser than anyone, intellectual, mental, so physically healthier, mentally healthier. And then he had understanding in visions, right? Which is the spiritual. So physical, emotional, and spiritual. You can't separate all three. So that's a good point. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, do you guess? Um, I just want to share, um, share with you that recently I had a situation where I needed to go. I felt that the Lord was leading me to go through that process. And um, I just want to share that God really can help you to walk through that process as well. Amen. And there is a lot of, when you get to the dark places in your life, there is a lot of forgiveness that needs to happen. Um, because sometimes we don't realize that we are holding on to some situations, difficult situations. And there is a lot of prayer for others as well. Yeah. Because one of the things that I found, there are some things that I can change. There are other things that I cannot change. Yeah. So that's when forgiveness comes and praying for, for, for other people. Because you cannot change others or circumstances. So, and that's liberating. That's mm. very liberating, finding the root cause, but then the Lord has a process, and he promised, and he, he, he that will help you to get to the dark places also will help you to, um, to find healing, to just go through these, these different aspects of that dark situation, because sadly to say, many of those situations are very complicated. Yes. There are mom, there is pop, dad, yeah. there is this, and this happened, and... And, but if you go with a very searching for healing, the Lord will give you the healing, will help you to kind of sort things out in your mind, that then you can just close that, give thanks, give it to the Lord, and move with a new life. Amen. Amen. I agree. So this one is thought right here. Okay, there are three chairs. I'm adding a fourth chair because there's another chair here. Because cognitive behavior therapy... Um, deals with this thoughts, feelings, be behavior. Thoughts, feelings, they call it behavior. Cognitive behavior therapy. But they're telling you that you just got to change your thoughts. Change it to positive thoughts, which is true. But you of your own self can do nothing. Does that make sense? What you need to do is that you need to change your thoughts, yes. But all you can do is behold the thoughts of Jesus <laughs> and behold his thoughts and by beholding your thoughts your thoughts become change and this is where pop psychology without God they cannot change does that make sense that's why you have to bring God into the picture because only God by beholding the goodness of God your evil thoughts changes to good thoughts right and then your good thoughts changes to good feelings 
then it changes to good behavior. That's clear. Let me say amen. Amen? amen. So that's where the gospel really comes in, in that aspect. Um, any, um, I just wanted to share that. Uh, Chris, could you? There's like flyers out there. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit. I know uh, Mr. Rodriguez saying I could share with the, with the, yeah, she wanted me to share with, you could just hand it out to everybody, maybe a flyer. Um, no, I'm good. Yeah, thank you. So maybe somebody could help him. A few people can help him. And um, we'll get this flower. So this is actually our 10-day school. You can tell us a little bit about it. You can go to the website. But that's our goal. We want to teach you how to reason from cause to effect and actually learn uh, how to help people to experience healing. But it's interesting that we get mental health professionals coming to our school, and one of the last one we received, she said, you know, Pastor, I came to your school because I want to take these principles of your spirituality to my mental health practice. But I realized that here I am running around trying to heal everybody, but I was the one that needed healing myself. And she said, I, on my whole plane ride, she flew all the way from the mainland. We have people... More than half of our people fly from the mainland to Hawaii to come to our school. And she said that the whole time she was flying back to the mainland, she was crying because she says, as if I found Jesus for the first time. And she's a pastor's kid. <laughs> and so I think a lot of people are really searching for healing. Like I said, mental health professionals and, and ministers, they go into the field of healing, looking for healing in themselves, but they never experience healing for themselves. And these are Christian counselors. And so, and ministers. So I believe that, you know, God has called his ministry to help people and is here to help you to learn cause and effect, to learn certain principles, not only for, to help other people, but everyone who has come who has said, I'm here to learn to help someone else, every single person has said that this was really for them. So you're going to really find out that this is not only going to help you, but it's really to help other people. It's really, because you can't help other people if you're not, healed yourself. You have to give what you do possess. So, without any questions, anyone has? Okay, go ahead. We have a school in Hawaii every October, 10 days from now, and we have a school in Australia, and that's coming up in um, next month already. So, um, This is not really a question. Okay. It's more about uh, like a comment based on what you said about, you know, um, beholding Christ and then your thought patterns change, your feelings change, and your, your actions change. Um, so this, this is like a testimony, kind of. Okay. Um, when, when I first, you know, had my conversion experience, and the Lord was, I was, you know, in the Word, I was, you know, so in love with Jesus. I was, you know, He was teaching me a lot about Himself, and myself too. I realized that I, um, because, because of like verbal abuse that I experienced growing up, I hated myself, you know, I never loved myself one bit. And so Jesus had, he, I had very low, very low self-esteem. I didn't care what if people, you know, praised me for anything or say, oh, that was a good job. I didn't think it was a good job because, you know, I didn't think I was worth much. Um, and so Jesus told me, stop. You can't accept my love when you don't. You know, you can't say, oh, I know Jesus loves me. I love Jesus too when you don't love yourself. Because, you know, how can that can go together? So, you know, it was very painful. Like someone, someone reached out their hand and took a mask off my face, and that mask was sewn to my skin. Mm. That's how painful it was to accept the fact that, yes, I did not love myself, you know, but how do I move on from that? And that's when no one, no one realized what was going on. No, I didn't talk to anyone about it. It was just me and mm. Jesus. Mm. And, you know, I had to sit down and cry it out. I had to cry. You know, you just, I couldn't do anything but cry and realize, Lord, this was something that I held in my heart for so long, and I didn't even realize it too. You know, because as a child, you know, life is busy. You, you, I'm a taught, especially as a Caribbean um, 
know, born and raised in the Caribbean, you're taught to just move on, don't think about it. Uh -huh. So all those emotions just, I never sat down to think about why I was feeling the way I felt. Because I never realized that me putting myself down was not okay. Wow. You know, and so when I read, when, when the Lord opened his word before me, you know, I, I started to read his word and said, Lord, you know, I realized that this is the problem. You know, how do I change from that? Wow. You know, because I can't really stop what people will say about me, but I can filter out, you know, whether I'll accept it or not. You know, wow. because I accepted it and I, you know, I made those, especially when Satan would, you know, put thoughts in my mind of, you know, it's worthlessness. You know, yeah. I'd meditate on that. Yeah. And I'll believe his lies more than believe his truth about God's love for me. Amen. And so, you know, the Lord, he helped me to overcome that and to say, you know, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. You know, the Lord yeah. has helped me to do so much, you know, great things for him and in me too. So I can, I, I, I see my self-worth as, you know, not as anything I can do, but what Christ can do in me and through me. And so the Lord has helped me to do It's a constant struggle. It's not something that you just co overcome, you know, overnight. But it's like a constant reminder that the Lord is telling me, you know, I love you. And yes, we're, what, what you do does not affect how much I love you. I love you regardless of what you do. You know, it's just, he just loves me. And I had, to, I had to come to terms with that. I had to say, okay, Lord. And I had, to, I had to remind myself, like, keep myself in check. If, I, if, I, if something like, you know, I dropped a, a cup, I could not, I had to say no, no, no negative thoughts whatsoever. I had to stop myself, you know, and I kept doing that. I kept doing that. I kept doing that, claiming God's promises, claiming his promises, saying, you know, it's okay. We're humans. We're going to mess up. It's okay. You, you don't blame yourself. You don't beat yourself up for it. You just learn from the mistake and move on. You know, and it's still very hard for me, and the Lord is helping me, but so many of the things that I used to struggle with, you know, I don't struggle with anymore because I'm seeing myself in Christ and what he can do for me and through me and the healing that he's already given me. Amen. Amen. So, oh. so um, I was just wanting to have you explain maybe or a little bit or clarify more because you you made the comment that anytime someone struggles with self-worth issues uh -huh. there's abuse in yeah. their past yeah and to me it seems like maybe it might be possible that a person could really struggle with self-worth not having been abused by somebody else but abuse themselves and maybe you were including that in it like they uh, abuse themselves. Well, in that their own, our own, what was like the mind. lady, her own choices uh, or thought yeah. about herself may not be related to somebody else's action toward them as much as is the devil hounding. You're not any good. You blew it. And, you know, you, you messed up here. Yeah, and, yeah. and then we get really poor on ourselves because I'm a little bit hesitant to think that, you know, if I feel this way, I must have been abused when I may not have been. It might be my own. The devil's attacking me. And I don't know, I just wanted to get your thought on that perspective. Yes, yeah, true. I'm sure that there's an internal, I mean, internal is the worst. Self is the worst enemy, right? And the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But there must have been some type thing in the past that created to hear all those voices. Like, what was it? Whether it was um, the abuse, whether how your parents were verbally abused or emotionally abused, or maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a kid at school teasing you. I mean, that's. Whatever it was to manipulate or control you, um, could have been from church leadership in a church, whatever type of abuse there is, it's going to affect you. And we will live in a world of sin. It's not like we've been not ever been sinned against in this world. Everyone has been sinned against and been hurt in some way. And I'm sure that definitely initiated things. They want me to be in the light. <laughs> but initiated things that kind of made it worse in your mind. Because a lot of times, there's so many voices and Many of those voices that we hear is actually just the world reaffirming it by how not only what they say, but how they treat you or not treat you. Or I think there's something with the world that kind of starts it off, but we really don't need the world to do it. So I can see how heart can make, our, make it bad for us. But for the most part, with a deep depression and deep self, low self-worth, you can always see there's something where something happened in the past where they've been hurt in a tragic way that's very deep that runs. Because all of us struggle with what is our worth in some sense. 
but some would fall with extremely low self-worth that there's always one or many triggers that happened in the past, yeah. especially the torment of your own mind that does it every day. This makes me think of a uh, lady I did Bible study with for a year or so when I was a pastor. Uh, Someone never realized until I talked to this lady, the low self-esteem can cause people not to want to give up their jewelry. And I discovered this in talking to this lady, how, how she would tell me she would wear her jewelry in the usual ways so people would look at her hand and not her face. When I heard that, I realized what was going on, you see. Mm-hmm. So I started reaffirming to her the love of God, Amen. the value put on her at Calvary. Mm-hmm. She took off her rings right there in front of me when mm-hmm. I did that. And, and so, um, but some people won't accept that. I've, found, I've met some people who won't accept that remedy of the cross for their self-value, to, to, as remedy for their self-worth problem. Have you run into this? And if so, there was another approach to this? I think we have to, like, um, like our worth is based upon how much someone thinks we're worth. So we have to look in the light of what that person's going through. Like, had they felt they were, like, the low self worth, like Father said, you, they never felt like they're good enough because they always put down, like, why don't you be like your sister, you know, who's going to be a doctor? Why don't you be like your brother who always goes to church every week? You know, and so they always feel compared. They're never going to be good enough. And so they're never reaching that, that you know, that, that level where they can feel loved and accepted. So you have to break that, and you have to, like, show them that the gospel shows that God Romans 5 verse 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, before you were good, before you were perfect, before you made any changes in your life, God loved you and accepted you just as you are. See, if you're always going to, and that's what people live in fear, because if that's the gospel where right there is like, I have to reach a certain point. If I don't do the dress reform, you're not going to talk to me. If I don't eat vegan like you, then you're not going to even like give, say hi to me in the morning. If that's the motivation, then I'm living in fear that I'm never going to be good enough, and I, have, and I think if that's how you treat me, that's how God treats me, right? So you got to come to the point, no, the gospel says that, you know, Christ saves you because it's free gospel, and because you know that God, by his grace, he has saved you, by his grace, of course, right? You can walk in perfect freedom because you're not living in fear, because fear is of the devil, right? Perfect love, God is love, casts out what? All fear, right? The Bible says the devil's believe and what tremble they tremble because they what they have fear they're afraid so the fear of satan's the 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 foundation of satan's government is based upon fear all mental illness phobias over 530 phobias all based upon fear phobias fear so satan controls you through fear and that's the whole great controversy. The great controversy is, in the last days in Revelation 13, there's going to be a group of people wanting to control you through fear that if you don't do this, then you can't buy or sell. To control you through fear that if you don't do this, they're going to finally going to kill you, right? So that's Satan's government. He wants to bring in this world. That's the final crisis, the great controversy. We know as prophecy in the last days, yet that's happening today. The spirit of Babylon is alive and when people try to control people. So setting them free from you know, that by saying, you know, no matter what, we love you exactly as you are, and then walk in that freedom, the gospel of righteousness by faith, that is freedom, and they walk in freedom, and they can gain victories. You can never gain victory when you're living your Christian walk through fear, because fear just paralyzes you. You either fight, flight, or freeze, and you can't think, bypasses your, your thinking processes when you live in fear. So, and God's love, like you said, yeah, um, it does work, but you have to tailor it again. I think you have to tailor the, yourself, the solution of the gospel. You have to apply it specifically to their... The main point is you've got to show them how much they're worth um, from God's eyes and the value that God paid for on the cross, but you have to apply it specifically to that specific situation. So that's how you deal with self-worth in that sense, but in a practical way um, for their situation. Because yeah. we can use a lot of like Adventist words, Adventist, like this... Adventist jargon has its own language, and we can use it so much. We throw it out there, heavenly the sanctuary, and you know, 23, 70 week prophecy, and people get lost in these words. But we have to make it real and practical and very simple for them. Amen. 
Oh, that helped. Okay, go ahead. Well, how about we just uh, kind of start wrapping it up? How's that sound? Okay. Yeah. So let's say that someone has never really experienced love in their life. Mm. And coming from that standpoint of where he says God loves you and reaffirming God's love, they won't be able to comprehend that. They're not going to get it. So that's why, good point. So that's why, example, I was counseling this one young man in Loma Linda, and I was saying, I was trying to explain his love-based solution for a specific root cause. And he said to me, I hear what you're saying, but I don't know what it looks like. So I'm like, okay, I'm not explaining it correctly. I need to explain it in a different way. So I try to explain it in a different angle. And he said, I hear what you're saying, but I don't know what it looks like. I'm like, oh, okay, so let me explain it in a different way. So I try to explain it in a different way. And finally say, look, I hear what you're saying, but I don't know what it looks like because in my home, I never saw what love looks like. And then it hit me like, he's not asking me to explain in a different way what love, love, look, what love looks like. He wants to see it in action. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized we got to do a school. We got, they got to see love for the first time, what love looks like, and how the staff interacts with each other and the students. And that's why I feel that is the healing process. And that's why even John said, right, that which I have seen, right, and that which I have heard, seen and heard, right, and handled with my hands the word of life. In other words, it's not only good enough to hear it, but you got to see it. You got to experience it. You got to touch it and feel it. And people in this world, this broken generation, Generation Z, they are looking. That's why it's not to say when the knowledge of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in our, up here in our brains, then, the, then Christ will come again. No. When the character of Christ, people are living it, it, is perfectly reproduced, then Christ will come back, right? So it's not just talking about it. It's not a mere intellectual ascent up here. And theology is actually love being revealed in action in your life that's going to change people. And that's more important. Actions speaks louder <laughs> than words. Amen. So, that's a good way to end. Yeah, how's that sound? Can we do that? Because it's kind of, kind of late already, so I know you're getting tired. Okay, why don't we, uh, let's stand for prayer, huh? Let's pray. Father, thank you for just the honor to be here and the privilege and just a blessing to me so much beautiful people and this our family, getting to know them and them knowing, knowing us. I pray that you will continue to bless this school, uh, the staff, the faculty, the students, and just all the workers here, Lord. I pray that you will continue to pour your anointing upon them and may they continue to seek truth in all aspects, physically, mentally, and spiritually. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you, everyone. We see you. We leave tomorrow morning, so it's been a privilege to meet all of you and we're gonna miss you guys we enjoyed you guys thank you I just want to say that how appreciative we are of your ministry here pastor Thompson thank you so much for coming and uh, I know you've given us all a lot to think about and uh, but what I really like is your emphasis on the Bible and and that's the source you know returning our thoughts to what God has to tell us and, and prayer. So uh, thank you from all of us for, for your ministry, and I know that uh, we've all been blessed. Thank you so much for joining us here at Wachita Hills Academy and College for our weekend program. We sincerely hope that you have been blessed by this program. Uh, to continue to spread this good news, you can go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Make sure to click that little notification bell so you know when we upload our next video. You can also check us out on Facebook and Instagram, and the links to those will be in the description. Thank you so much again for joining us today, and we hope that you have a blessed Sabbath.